Okay. How to present a philosopher quasi absent in Ghent? Now, I'll do this not by introducing him to you, but you to him. Starting with um, his absence, quasi absence, at our philosophy department, the place where I work for the moment. Slava Zizek does not really figure in the courses. Maybe his name is mentioned by some once in a while, but for the moment, that's all. But sometimes being absent makes one very present. Uh, think about the Dutch phrase, schitteren door afwezigheid, or in English, to be conspicuous by one's absence. But to truly account for that, for how absence relates to presence, negativity to positivity, does one not need to refer to Freud, uh, Lacan, Hegel, or for that matter, Marx? Think of Freud saying in Totem and Taboo that the dead father, the murdered father, became ever so strong than he was alive. But of course, Freud, Lacan, Hegel, and Marx are also not very present here in Ghent. At least our philosophy department does not choose these authors. So clearly the issue of presence and absence is about making choices, theoretically and also perhaps politically. So if Zizek is here, he is, thanks to the choice of the students. So hence we, if I'm allowed to use the we of course, we the department, we Ghent University, should try to understand the choice of the students. But here it becomes, it becomes tricky. Very tricky. Remember uh, the mainstream politicians saying, when a lot of people don't vote mainstream, we have understood your protest. We have understood your vote. So in the same way, one could say, addressing the students, you chose Zizek because you know something. What you know, you can't explain, but you feel it. You don't know what it is, but it's there, like a splinter in your mind. We understand this. <clears throat> of course, I'm paraphrasing here the movie The Matrix. So you are awaiting the offer of the blue or the red pill. You understand the tricky part here? That is, we understanding the choice of the students. That is, psychologizing their choice. Missing that it are perhaps they who interpolate us, offering us a choice between the blue or the red pill. Hence, isn't it remarkable that as I once heard uh, say, that Zizek uh, mixes politics with psychology, which is, of course, uh, a pure blasphemy in the sense that psychoanalysis is no psychology, it is a critique of psychology, that those who oppose him, and I have no idea how many you are here tonight, resort to psychology to explain his appeal, to explain his popularity. For example, when in 2010 Zizek was in Brussels, some Belgian philosophers called him in the national press the Pied Piper of Hamelin, pointing to those, and I quote, who lay down next to his feet and hang onto every word. Does all this not evoke a socio-psychological reading, pointing in the end to the psychology of the leader and hence silently refers to Freud's psychology of the masses. So I argue that even those who are merely bypassing Zizek or in general the theory or praxis he stands for and hold high that we should choose for philosophy proper cannot but fall back into a kind of occluded, simplifying psychologization, showing hence that choosing is not a simple question of choosing between two alternatives. Summarized in a simple subtraction, Philosophy minus psychoanalysis equals psychology. Consider, for example, a Flemish philosopher saying that a psychoanalyst tells you about the same things your wife could tell you. What a remarkable comparison. Is he not soliciting or even begging a psychologizing response? Tell me, why do you compare your wife to a psychoanalyst? Do you want them both to shut up or is it their silences that you're really afraid of? At the very least, defending A against B, one cannot simply uh, return to A as such. One ends up with A plus. 
That's, uh, which is to say, you end up with a surplus with an excess. And here it might get uh, interesting. For to understand this logic of the excess, let me refer to Jacques Lacan and his trite of the symbolic, the imaginary, and the real. The latter, the real, and I think that uh, Zizek's work uh, co continuously points to this, the real should be carefully defined. As such, the real is that what um, is that what does not function, that which, in contrast to reality, cannot be mastered and incites anxiety. However, the crucial point is not to mistake the real for that what is too much for the symbolic to be mastered and by the imaginary. Rather, in a Lacanian perspective, the real is at the side of the too much of the symbolic. It's the monstrous excess which sees light precisely because the human being speaks. So it's the language running rampant. It's the cancerous outgrowth of language. To illustrate this, the naive option would be, I feel so much inside of me, but I can't put it into words. So that would be the naive conception of the real. To which we have to oppose the uh, proper psychoanalytic real, which is, I say so much that it eventually escapes me, that is, as I speak, an excess arises that I, as a subject, subject, cannot fully master or control. This is the true psychoanalytic unconsciousness. This is the Lacanian real. And precisely this excess might be in play with the student's choice. So inviting Zizek eventually could have an interpolative force beyond that choice itself. And this logic of the excess is also that what is missed by those opposing psychoanalysis, arguing, for example, that psychoanalysis doesn't care for empirical reality. It drives those critics into the arms of psychology and it's normalizing ideological models of reality, or it makes them reproduce the Freudianisms they, they themselves reject. But let's approach the logic of the excess still differently by relating it to one of our uh, central current predicaments, that is the digitalization of subjectivity, an issue which uh, also Zizek uh, touched, up, touched upon recently in his comments on Elon Musk's uh, Neuralink program, the program uh, attempting to interface brain and computer. If one could say that the slogan, the revolution will not be televised, misses that a revolution engendered by televisization, which is a nice word, I think, um, then it also might not be helpful to claim subjectivity will not be digitalized. So instead of claiming there is too much subjectivity to be digitally modeled, one should situate the too much at the site uh, of digitalization itself, and look how this would affect subjectivation. So, and as also uh, Zizek has hinted to, the crucial question today is then, what if digitalization will be able to model this excess too, to bring it into its circuits, control it and make profit from it? But is then not the central issue which models would be used to do that? to recuperate the excess. Now think in this respect of Ray Kurzweil's phantasmatic idea to upload the human brain to a computer. Is there not the question with, with which models or, or algorithms would this be done? With psychoanalytic or behavioristic ones? So are we here not back with the choices, theoretical and political choices? How would you prefer to be uploaded? in a Freudian or in a Pavlovian way. By the way, when I once asked this in a psychology class, a student spontaneously exclaimed, oh, surely not in a Freudian way. So while I was thinking, I was offering the students the blue or the red pill, the student showed that, the, that my interpolation only presented him with a pseudo choice between Pavlov and the mainstream textbook image of Freud. At the least, I learned that uh, we should try to, uh, to transcend the pseudo choices. Today, this is Trump or Clinton, Le Pen or Macron, 
And should I add here the rector elections at Ghent University? Perhaps the thing to do is to trade all these debilitating choices with other enforced choices. That is, choices which enforce themselves. Cho choices where you can't have the one without the other. For example, I could argue, you cannot have Marx without Lacan, and vice versa. That is, while those Marxists rejecting Lacan end up in mainstream psychology, the psychoanalysts rejecting Marx also risk, up, risk to end up in psychology when it comes to understand the alienation of the subject, which is, of course, uh, a variant of the enforced choice which I hinted at earlier. You cannot have philosophy without, psychoanal without, without psychoanalysts. Philosophy minus psychoanalysis equals mainstream psychology. So, dear colleagues of the philosophy department, and I have no idea how many of you uh, are here tonight, because it's hard to see. Today, your choice was right. You are here. You chose Zizek because you had to. The students made you to. And with this uh, last line, I uh, would like to give the floor to Slava Zizek. Thank you very much. I am glad to be here. I am honored to be here. I'm just afraid I don't know what to expect from you or what do you expect from me. I hope you will not find the talk too boring because I wanted at least vaguely to really talk about what the title announces, <laughs> populism. So I will at least begin in this way, and then we will jump from here to there, and so on. So I will now first recapitulate some old stuff, namely, I still, in spite of today's popularity, even leftists speak about populism as the return of the political, of the political antagonism, which may give, install new passion into our, into our uh, fossilized democracy. Why? I am still opposed to populism as something dangerous. So, what is populism? Gerald Fitzgerald, the Irish Prime Minister 20 years ago, once turned around the common wisdom. You know, as they say, this may be good for theory, but it's not good enough for practice. In a debate in Irish Parliament, Fitzgerald said, about his opponent's proposal. This may be good enough for practice, but it is not good enough for theory. This reversal best encapsulates the ambiguous position of populist politics. While it can sometimes be endorsed as part of a short-term pragmatic compromise, one should reject the notion of populism in its fundamental dimension. Why? Populism potentially tends to suspend democratic rules. Democracy, in the way this term is used today, concerns above all formal legalism. Its minimal definition of democracy is the unconditional adherence to a certain set of formal rules which guarantee that antagonisms are fully absorbed into the agonistic political game. Democracy means that whatever electoral manipulation took place, every political agent will unconditionally respect the results. In this sense, the American presidential elections of 2000, you remember when, after all the comedy, Bush won over Al Gore, were effectively democratic. In spite of obvious electoral manipulations and of the patent meaninglessness of the fact that a couple of hundred of Florida votes decided who will be the president, the Democratic candidate accepted his defeat. In the weeks of uncertainty after these elections, Bill Clinton made a nice comment. He said, the American people have spoken, 
we just don't know what they said. This comment should be taken more seriously than it was meant. Even now we don't know it, and maybe there was no substantial message behind the result of it all. I'm especially suspicious in this new animistic spirit when what the people wanted to say, or today, did you notice how in economy we witness a massive return of animism? Markets are an entity which send the message, reacts with fear, and so on and so on. Jacques, Lacan, uh, Jacques Alain Miller sorry, elaborated how democracy implies the so called Bart Big Other, symbolic substance. However, the Florida example demonstrates that, nonetheless, in democracy, there is a big other, the procedural big other of electoral rules, which should be obeyed, whatever the result. And it is this big other, this conditional, sorry, unconditional reliance on rules that populism threatens to suspend, which is why there is in populism always something violent, threatening for the liberal view. An open or latent pressure, a warning that if elections will be manipulated, the will of the people will have to find another way to impose itself. So even if electoral legitimization of power is respected, it is made clear that elections play a secondary role, that they serve only to confirm a political process whose substantial weight lies elsewhere. This is what gives, let's call it, the thrill to populist regimes. In them, democratic rules are never fully endorsed. There is always an uncertainty that pertains to them. A possibility always looms that these rules will be redefined unfairly changed in the middle of the game or whatever. This aspect of populism should be, I think, fully endorsed. The problem is not this undemocratic dimension of populism, but it's populist relying on the substantial notion of the people. In populism, there is a big other, a substantial place of truth. It's the people as the substantial agent legitimizing power. Today's populism is different from the traditional version. What distinguishes it is the opponent against which it mobilizes the people. Today we witness, as we all know, the rise of so-called post-politics, the growing reduction of politics proper to rational administration of conflicting interests. Interests. In the highly developed countries of the United States and Western Europe, populism is emerging as the inherent shadowy double of the institutionalized post-politics. Uh, as the arena in which political demands that do not fit the institutionalized space can be articulated. In this sense, there is a constitutive mystification that pertains to populism. Its basic gesture is to refuse to confront the complexity of the situation, to reduce it to a clear struggle with a pseudo-concrete enemy figure, Brussels bureaucracy, illegal immigrants, or whatsoever. Uh, so let me here quote Ernesto Laclau, who developed a theory of populism. I don't agree with him, but he made one precise, correct point about British Chartism from 1840s. It's a form of populism. I quote Laclau. Its dominant leitmotif is to situate the evils of society not in something that is inherent in the economic system, but quite the opposite, in the abuse of power by parasitic and speculative groups which have control, which control political power, old corruption and so on. It was for this reason that the feature most strongly picked out in the ruling class by populists was its idleness and parasitism." End of quote. In other words, for a populist, the cause of 
our troubles is ultimately never the system as such, but the intruder who corrupts it. Financial manipulators, not capitalists as such, and so on. It's never a fatal flaw inscribed into the structure as such, but an element that doesn't play its role within the structure properly. For a Marxist, on the contrary, or for a Freudian, the pathological deviating misbehavior of some element, crisis and so on, is the symptom of the normal. It is an indicator of what is wrong in the very structure. Uh, that's why uh, what characterizes populism is always a pseudo-concrete figure, which is selected as the enemy, the singular agent behind all that poses a threat to the people. For example, the pseudo-concrete populist figure of the Jew that condenses the vast multitude of anonymous forces that determine us Jew as the enemy emerges from outside the social demands that experience themselves as frustrated. And I think today, with the rise of new right-wing populism, <coughs> this game of oversimplification, of pseudo-concrete figure of an enemy, is reaching absurd extremes. You should follow the latest rumors, which are no longer rumors in some countries, like most of the post-communist East European countries, they are now, it's horrible, part of the public discourse. And I tried to reconstruct this theory. It's the following one. I'm not kidding. It's in public. That uh, the first premise is that there was a Holocaust, but it was organized by Jews themselves. Jews wanted to destroy Western Europe, and they know that Germany is the strongest backbone of it. French are decadent, British are utilitarian, Germany is the threat. So they sacrificed millions of themselves to break morally Germany. So that Germany feels guilty for Holocaust, and now Germany, Angela Merkel, that's why she invited uh, 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 Muslim immigrants, because she lacks the will to resist. Now, then, they make a step further. There is no Arab-Israeli conflict. This is conflict is just staged for the West. In reality, behind chaotic Muslim refugees, there is the figure of the Jew, Soros or another, because Arabs and Jews, Muslim Arabs and Jews, share the same goal to destroy Western Christianity. Now, you know what's so sad? That something like this, which was still my God, till five years ago, maybe even, something that maybe, if you are crazy, you speak in a, in a bar or in the evening with your crazy lunatic friends, is now part of the public discourse. I would worry about that. And I don't have time to develop more of it, but there is another sad aspect here, where even some leftists get caught into this game. I developed years ago a notion which is now accepted even by all of my, at least Jewish friends, the notion of Zionist anti-Semitism. It's a position which you find, I'm not kidding, already by one of the true monsters of 20th century European history, Reinhard Heydrich, you know, the father of Holocaust and so on, rather executor. He wrote, I don't have it here, I'm sorry, a crazy text in, I think, 36 or 7, where he said, Jews are in, something like this, Jews are incredibly creative, active, dynamic people. We wish them all the best, but not here in Germany. Our conflict is not with Jews as such, but with those Jews who are invisible among us. If the Jews move to Palestine, we will give them economic help they are wonderful, creative people. We cannot wait to develop our ties with them, and so on and so on. So, Zionism is good if Jews go out. Jews are bad here. You find exactly the same position you should read him with Breivik, you know, the Norwegian guy. He said we should absolutely support Israel there. It's a wall 
protecting Europe from Muslim barbarians and so on. But here we have too many Jews, not here. What the sad thing that is happening now is that a similar logic is developing apropos Islam. In a homologous way, we find pro-Muslim Islamophobia with the same logic. Muslims are bad if they are here, but there we should support them, even if they are authoritarian, all the better they will organize their lives uh, and uh, come. This is why, even if they formally protested, most of the Western powers, especially the bad guys from Trump onwards, immediately sincerely congratulated Erdogan in winning that uh, referendum or whatever for the extension of his authoritarian power. Again, it's the same logic. We don't want refugees here, they disturb European order, but there, let them even support them, organize their order, and that's the horror that is emerging today, a new obscene multiculturalism. Like, uh, we have universality of the market, but this universality is less and less accompanied, even by, no matter how bourgeois distorted, emancipatory universal ideals, e e egality, freedom, human rights, whatever. It is like Fukuyama combined with Huntington. Not clash of civilization, but a peaceful coexistence of different ways of life, of course, against the background of uh, uh, global market rule. A typical politician for me today, for example, is uh, uh, Modi, the Prime Minister of India. At the same time, radical neoliberal in economy and rather harsh Hindu nationalist in ideology. China is doing the same, Turkey is now doing the same, and in its own way, even Trump is doing the same. I think that this tendency is very dangerous, and back to my point, uh, yes, I want to tell you another wonderful joke. I repeated it in a couple of times in my uh, uh, books, which encapsulates the best this logic of Zionist anti-Semitism. Uh, Die Presse, Ast Austrian daily newspaper, published some 20 years ago a wonderful caricature. You see two Austrians in this almost caricatural way, neo-Nazis, hard drinking beer, and uh, one of them holds in his hands a newspaper and points at it in a newspaper, obviously, to an article critical of Israel, and says something like, you see how a perfectly rational anti-Semitism is here misused for uh, unfair criticism of Israel. So you see, it's the other way around. It's not you pretend just to criticize Israel, but you are really anti-Semitic. It's the other way around. Anti-Semitism is okay, no Jews here, but don't touch Israel. And the saddest thing is that the government of Israel more and more accepts this game. So, back to populism. The reason I'm opposed to populism is that inherently it's mystifying. Populism is not just popular mobilization against ossified, bureaucratic, uh, democratic procedures, whatever. It has always this idea, pointed out nicely by that quote from Ernesto Laclau, of a basic popular unity of people and the system threatened by just a contingent, uh, a contingent malfunction, corruption, or whatever. Again, it can be international capital, against which, of course, we can put our bets on our own honest local bourgeoisie, it's the dangerous immigrants or whatever. So I don't have a soft spot if you ask me for populism. Why not? Because it's absolutely elementary for me that today the critical point, the ultimate cause of our troubles is an imbalance or whatever, structural imbalance, antagonism in global capitalism as such. It's not just a contingent malfunctioning here and there. So, uh, to understand today's populism, 
The best example of our crisis, which can allow us this understanding, is probably, I am tempted to say, the weird case of the recent French presidential elections, Macron versus Marine Le Pen. Why? Let me begin with another joke that I like. They are my favorite jokes, the ones from Soviet Union, jokes about Radio Erevan. You know, this was a legendary, it, there was a real Radio Erevan, but the topic of jokes was some mystical Radio Erevan where viewers asked, listeners, sorry, asked questions and Radio Erevan in this cold bureaucratic way answered always in the same way. In principle, yes, but. <laughs> For example, the latest I've heard, it's a very racist one, but I like it, is that, uh, uh, you know, do you also have in Academy of Sciences, I think you distinguish regular and corresponding members, no? Regular member is more, full member. Corresponding, you are not yet there. And the joke is referring to some less developed Soviet Republic. Is it true that that guy from that Republic was accepted, made member of their Academy of Sciences? Then a guy says, uh, how can this happen? They asked uh, Radio Erevan, but how could this have happened when that guy is illiterate? Radio Erevan answers, in principle it's possible because he was not made a, a, a corresponding member, but a regular member, and you have to read and write just if you correspond, it's <laughs> vulgar. But another better joke, uh, a listener asks Radio Erevan, is it true that Rabinovich, another legendary figure of Soviet jokes, the Jew Rabinovich won a new car on lottery? The radio answers, in principle it's true, only it wasn't a new car, but an old bicycle, and he didn't win it, but it was stolen from him. <laughs> the same goes, I think, for the French presidential elections of 2017. We may ask Radio Erevan, is it true that in a great display of anti-fascist unity, people of France elected an outsider and defeated a fascist threat to Europe? Radio Erevan answers, in principle, yes. Only the victorious Macron embodies Europe out of touch with ordinary people. That is to say, the very politics which gave such strength to Le Pen and Macron is not an outsider, but establishment at its purest. Of course, Le Pen and Macron are not the same. The difference that separates the two is obvious, but nonetheless, the choice between the two was not the real choice. To see this, it's enough to focus on the background of the two candidates. Marine Le Pen is a racist populist, but she also addresses popular workers' discontent. Macron presents himself as tolerant, human, pro-European, but the economic policy he stands for is the main cause of the popular dissatisfaction with Europe. So the message of Macron's victory is not the fascist threat awakened us, but quite the opposite. The nightmare is over, we can go to sleep again. Macron's victory opens up the, for me at least, terrifying prospect of a future in which the same sterile, stagnant politics will go on in European Union. Just every four years, we will be mobilized to defeat the fascist threat and in between we'll be able to sleep in the safe embrace of global capitalism with a human face. The obscenity of the situation is breathtaking. Global capitalism is now presenting itself as the last protection against fascism. And if you try to point out some of Macron's limitations, you are accused of, yes, of complicity with fascism, since, as we are repeatedly told by big and not so big media, extreme left and extreme right are ultimately the same. They are coming together today, both are anti-Semitic, uh, nationalist, isolationist, anti-globalist and so on. This is, I think, the point of the whole operation, to make the left, which means any true alternative, disappear. The woman behind Macron is not his wife, but the proverbial Tina, the stance of there is no alternative. Macron doesn't bring hope, he 
kills hope. At this point, we reach the supreme irony of how ideology functions today. It appears precisely as its opposite, as a radical critique of ideological utopias. The predominant ideology today is not a positive vision of some utopian future, nobody believes in that, but a cynical resignation, an acceptance of how the world really is, accompanied by a warning that if you want to change it too much, only a totalitarian horror can ensue. Every vision of another world is dismissed as ideology. Alain Badiou put it in a wonderful and precise way. The main function of ideological censorship today is not to crush actual resistance, that is the job of repressive state apparatuses, but to crush hope, to immediately denounce every critical project as opening a path at the end of which is something like Gulag. So I think you should be very careful. Again, true ideologies today are not visionaries, a new order, but are this type of resigned cynics, which immediately agree with you if you say things don't function, they're corrupted, we have danger. Did I say, but is there any chance? Why resist if you all big plans can make things only worse and so on and so on? And uh, I find such a stance catastrophic. Why? Yes, there were mega problems with all attempts in the 20th century to radically change our societies. Communism ended up, the communist project, the way we had it in 20th century, very badly. But I claim problems remain here. There is no future for us without some kind of radical change. Now you will say, okay, I'm crazy. All I can say is, okay, maybe I'm crazy, but I'm not alone. A well-known, not even leftist, conservative liberal, Peter Sloterdijk, you know him, is here with me. I was nicely surprised reading Sloterdijk's last book, or it's no longer the last one before the last, Was Gescheint 20 Jahrhundert, What Happened in the 20th Century, where Sloterdijk, uh, proposes his vision of what is to be done in 21st century, best encapsulated by the titles of the first two essays in the book. The first chapter is on the Anthropocene, and the second, a wonderful title, from the domestication of men to the civilizing of cultures. What does Sloterdijk mean? Anthropocene designates a new epoch in the life of our planet as we all know, in which we humans cannot any longer rely on the earth as a reservoir ready to absorb the consequences of our productive activity. We cannot any longer afford to ignore the side effects or collateral damage of our productivity. Uh, these side effects cannot any longer be reduced to the background of the figure of humanity. We have to accept that we live on the so-called spaceship Earth, responsible, accountable for its conditions. So Earth is no longer the impenetrable, vast, inexhaustible background or horizon of our productive activity. It emerges as another finite object which we can inadvertently destroy or transform it to make it unlivable. This means that, and this is a nice paradox, at the very moment when we become powerful enough to affect the most basic conditions of our life, we have to accept that we are just another species on a small planet. So a new way to relate to our environment is necessary once we realize this. No longer this traditional humanist image of a heroic worker expressing his or their creative potentials and drawing from the inexhaustible resources of our environment, but a much more modest agent collaborating with his or their environment, permanently negotiating a tolerable level of safety and stability. Is the very model of ignoring this collateral damage not capitalism? What matters in capitalist reproduction 
is the self-enhancing circulation focused on profit and the collateral damage done to the environment is not included by definition into the costs of production. Even the attempts to take it into account, collateral damage, through taxation or whatever, cannot but misfire. There are incidentally, you should study them, some, I think, totally crazy proposals to solve this with taxation. So, for example, already when I was young in the 70s, some radical feminists claimed that women should get reimbursed for their unpaid work uh, of uh, taking care of children, cooking, maintaining home, and so on. That this should, somehow we should calculate how much this is worth, and every woman who does this should be given some additional <coughs> salary. Or there are today <coughs> similar attempts to simply calculate, it's crazy, the price of earth, of air, of water in absolute terms, and then include it into the price. You know why this doesn't work? Because it amounts to a crazy ideal of total commodification. It wants fight to fight capitalism, but the result would have been radical commodification where everything is presented as a commodity. Woman's work, uh, uh, earth, water, whatever, whatever. It cannot but malfunction. So, for Sloterdijk, in order to establish this new mode of relating to our environment, a radical politico-economic change is necessary, what Sloterdijk calls the domestication of the wild animal culture. His point is that till now, each culture disciplined or educated its members and guaranteed civic peace among them in the guise of state power. But the relationship between different cultures and states was permanently under the shadow of potential war, with each state of peace nothing more than a temporary armistice. As Hegel conceptualized this, the entire ethic of a state culminates in the highest act of ter heroism, the readiness to sacrifice one's life for one's nation state, which means that the wild barbarian relation between states serve as the foundation of the ethical life within a state. I think it's quite a consequence realization by Sloterdijk that the more a state is civilized in the modern sense, the more the highest ideal is to sacrifice your life in a state of war. You know, this is the old Hegel's, Hegelian idea that in our everyday life, we live relatively corrupted utilitarian, in a relatively corrupted utilitarian way. You take care of your interest, love interest, you try to earn money, whatever. But that's just a corrupted, pragmatic life. From time to time, that's why for Hegel, wars are necessary. From time to time, you need to be reminded that, that you are more than an animal in search of pleasures, even if they are sublime pleasures. You need to be reminded of your highest duty, fidelity to your community, which can only happen through war, through risking your life. And as Sloterdijk says it clearly, uh, we have to move over this. This type of logic, state power, the highest ethical act, sacrificing your life, and so on, the time of this solution is over. Now, uh, this is easy, it's easy to say this, but difficult to do it, because when it comes to, but how to do this, and although Sloterdijk would have killed me if I were to tell him this, uh, what he is implicitly proposing is something that I cannot but call communism. Somehow to get over the nation state and to break out of capitalist logic of surplus, of the ever expanding profit seeking and so on and so on. It's a problem how to do it. Now you will say, but then why even try to do it? Why not simply say, let's live in our world, which is what it is, it's not so bad, and so on. I think it doesn't work. The crisis is coming. I agree here with Sloterdijk. Ecological crisis, refugees, political crisis, and so on and so on. 
the era of state, nation states as the supreme power and implicitly ethical agency, it's over. We have to make a next step. And if not, well, in a very popular way, the German sociologist economist, I hope he is read also here, Wolfgang Streck, proposed a wonderful simple theory, namely that uh, capitalism is already dying, changing into something else. In a very convincing way, I will not bore you with it, he demonstrates this. But he adds something which unfortunately I claim is deeply true. From our Marxist progressive, at least traditional Marxist standpoint, we always presuppose that the end of capitalism means that some higher, more organized force will replace it. And he says, no, what we get today is a much more pessimist prospect of capitalism just disintegrating gradually into local conflicts, lower productivity, whatever, chaos, and so on. But without prospect, any clear prospect of a new emancipatory agent replacing it with a higher level of collaboration and so on and so on. It's not things are falling apart because something new is emerging. It's not the snake is casting off the old skin because beneath it, it's a new, more healthy skin. No, it's just the old is rotting away without any clear way how the new can emerge. So what provides such a force to capitalism? I don't have time to develop it. I think uh, Jan, my friend, told me that he was here, my Slovene colleague, I don't fully agree with him, but he has many good points, Samo Tomšić, in his book on Marx and Lacan, he insists on, he tries to deploy systematically out of fragments of, different fragments in Lacan's work, something like Lacanian reading of critique of political economy. And his basic point is a strict parallel between what Marx calls Merwert, surplus value, and between what uh, Lacan calls plus de juir, mer genus, surplus enjoyment. In other words, capitalism is something unique. It's not just one among the modes of production. It is what already Marx suspected. A mode of production in which some fundamental feature of the entire human civilization, precisely this logic of excess, always more, which was in a latent way always here, but oppressed, rendered invisible by false stability, openly explodes. This is the moment of truth in those stupid theories that capitalism is a natural system. I'm simply saying the same as Marx when he says about labor, that universal labor appears as such as everyday experience only with capitalism. So what is this logic of surplus? Let me, to explain it, uh, refer to a scene from a Hitchcock film, but a scene which Hitchcock never shot. And he was right not to do it because it would be too direct, a little bit vulgar. Namely, in his conversations with Francois Truffaut, Hitchcock recalls a scene that he wanted to insert into his classic movie, North by Northwest. Uh, here is his description of the scene, listen carefully. I wanted to have a long dialogue between Cary Grant, who, the main role in the film, and one of the factory workers at the Ford automobile plant as they walk along the assembly line. Behind them, a car is being assembled piece by piece. You see everything, all components which go into a car. Finally, the car they, they have seen being put together from a simple nut and bolt is complete with gas and oil ready to drive off the line. The two men look at each other and say, isn't it wonderful? One of them opens the door of the car and out drops a corpse. So, you see the point. The car was just, where did the corpse come from? I think this is what Lacan calls ob object small a, the surplus object. 
It comes from nowhere. And it's nice that, don't forget if you are good Marxist, that Hitchcock describes here precisely the production process. And I think this corpse is somehow the surplus value, the surplus produced here. And uh, so this, again, would have been what Lacan calls plus de jouir, a surplus which is totally non-substantial, but comes by. And there are many paradoxes to account for this. For example, I use this so I can repeat it here, I hope just in one of my books. And a slightly obscene accident, but nobody will be hurt and wounded, that happened to me. Once, I will not say in which country, it would be too obscene, I talked with an elder lady, and my God, it's so uh, 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 shameful to say this, we were kind of flirting, and <laughs> probably she wanted, she had some evil intentions with me, so she told me that her last, she was in her middle age, but beautiful. And she told me that her last lover, when he saw her naked, told her that, except for one or two kilo too much, her body is perfect. And I immediately told her, just don't try to lose that one or two kilos. Because, you know, this would be maybe the best example of what Lacan calls surplus enjoyment. Look, <laughs> you appear as if you have one or two kilos too much. But this ideal of beauty my God, how nice she would have been without that one or two kilos too much, is strictly a retroactive effect of those one or two kilos too much. You see the point? If you take one or two kilos too much away, you don't, you don't get a, a perfect body. You get an ordinary body. Because the perfection is precisely a retro, an retroactive effect of that very surplus which appears to destroy it. And this is how you should find uh, in many movie stories and in real life this, let's call it, uh, function, function of object A. And the same goes for Lacan, generally for libidinal economy. Another story, which I hope you don't know it, I quote it a couple of times in my book of the dysfunction of the excess, object A. My friend, the British Lacanian, okay, half Lacanian, half Kleinian, if we go into this dogmatic theological factional struggles, uh, Darian Leader told me a wonderful story. How once uh, a patient of him told him a strange slip of tongue that he, the patient, made. She took a lady to a hotel restaurant first to have dinner and then, of course, with the evil intention to take her up to a room, to a bed, and so on. So uh, what happened is that when the, they entered the restaurant, he made a stupid slip of tongue. Instead of a table for two, he said to the waiter, a bed for two, please, in the room. Now comes the genius of uh, Darian Leader. His reading of this was not the usual Freudian vulgar one. Yeah, yeah, eating was just a pretext. He was already in his mind with later, but exactly the opposite. He was afraid to enjoy eating there too much. And that this will then, you know, ruin even his ability to perform properly sexually afterwards. So it was a kind of ethical reminder to himself. Don't enjoy eating here too much. Don't forget your true duty is up there later. <laughs> you see here, this food eating there was object A. It was that surplus, but it should just remain a surplus if it is elevated too much into a self goal. It's a catastrophe. In this sense, already Freud proposed a wonderful concept, I think it's close to Lacan's uh, plus de jouir, surplus enjoyment of lust gewin, gain of pleasure. How? When you do something, you should never forget that the true enjoyment comes not from the pleasure 
of achieving your goal, but from the very process of approaching your goal and so on and so on. What do I mean by this? Let me give you a very sad first political example, no political, sorry, everyday example from a friend of mine in the United States. He told me that recently in the evening he went to Walmart, that big supermarkets, to buy something and he noticed, it was the evening close to closing time, near the exit there were many those shopping carts full of stuff commodities, but somebody abandoned them there. Why? He asked a salesperson there, and the salesperson told him, gave him a simple explanation. People who once had enough money to do regular shopping cannot any longer afford it. But the ritual means to them so much that regularly families come to Walmart store and imitate the form of shopping fill things in, enjoy it, and then at the end they just leave the stuff there and uh, go out. This is a nice example of how they get enjoyment, surplus enjoyment, but without the pleasure. The pleasure is the stupid pleasure of objects you buy, but the real pleasure is, of course, the very procedure. Or let me give you uh, the most terrifying example of this uh, surplus enjoyment. Uh, you should watch it. It's terrifying, but such a supreme example of what Lacan meant by surplus enjoyment. Joseph Goebbels, you know, in 43, after Stalingrad defeat of Germany, his famous speech in Berlin called the Total War, Total Krieg speech. Why is this speech so interesting? You should listen to the words. Germans were shocked by the Stalingrad defeat. And Goebbels did a wonderful thing, wonderful in a terrifying sense. It would have been much better for him not to succeed so much. He decided against the stupid opposition of many high-ranking Nazi people not to downplay the catastrophe, but to emphasize it even more to paint it in the darkest way. Let me tell you, a, let me read you a quote. I are, and with, oh, imagine all the Goebbels shouting and so on. I ask you, are you, the, the German nation, resolved to work 10, 12, and if need be, 14, 16 hours a day, if the fear should command it, and to give all, your all for victory? I ask you, do you want total war? Do you want it, if need be, even more total and radical that we are capable of imagining it today? I ask you, is your confidence in the Führer more passionate, more unshakable than ever? Is your readiness to follow him on all his path and to do whatever is necessary to bring the war to a successful conclusion absolute and unlimited, and so on and so on. I will not quote it all, but the, the basic paradox is this one. What Goebbels famous 20 or how much questions to the public, which are, of course, all answered with a resolute, yes, we are ready. There is no positive promise in them. It's simply, he's asking them, do you want to suffer more? You ain't seen nothing yet of suffering. Do you want to suffer more? Do you want to suffer to such an extent that you cannot even imagine how you will suffer? That's pleasure, surplus pleasure. As oppo sorry, surplus enjoyment as opposed, to, as opposed to pleasure. And it's extremely interesting to, to read, uh, to observe closely Goebbels' speech, uh, sorry, his face during his speech, because when he gets into this full enthusiasm, do you want more suffering and so on, his resolute, fanatical face changes into a weird sort of passive pleasure, like as if he's overwhelmed by some excessive pleasure. My last example, where I find also this type of surplus pleasure, uh, uh, this example, I warn you, is much more uh, 
problematic. The way we today uh, uh, treat refugees, the politically correct logic often mobilizes the mechanism of what one can call delegated sensitivity. Its line of argumentation is often, I'm tough enough, I'm not hurt by sexist and, sexist and racist hate speech or by making fun of the minorities, but I'm speaking for all those who may be hurt by it. The point of reference are thus the presupposed naive others, those who need protection because they may miss the irony or cannot stand attacked. It's as if I delegate the passive experience of a hurt sensitivity onto a naive other, thereby enacting the other's uh, infantilization. That's why we should ask ourselves if political correctness is really something that belongs to the left. Is it not a strategy of defense against radical leftist demands? A way to neutralize antagonisms instead of openly, uh, openly confronting them. Many of the oppressed feel clearly how the politically correct strategy often just adds insult to injury. While oppression remains, they, the oppressed, now even have to be grateful for how liberals try to protect them. Which is why, I don't want to lose too much time, but which is why I claim that I find suspicious this uh, ritualistic contemporary left liberal self-flagellation, you know, we Europeans are guilty, we are the worst you can imagine, we are guilty for everything bad that happens in the third world, it must be a consequence of our, of our uh, neo-colonialist uh, destructive impact or whatever, like, I isn't it clear how behind this apparent self-humiliation, in an inverted way, we still assert ourselves as masters? We like to be masters who show our open heart, oh yes, let's, let's receive refugees and so on and so on, and treat refugees as a humanitarian problem instead of treating it as a central geopolitical and economic point. It's much uh, trauma of our times. It's much easier to talk about we need more refugees, we should open ourselves to it too. Let's finally focus on what causes these refugees, of our economic acts, of our economic neo-colonialism. Are we aware, with all the humanitarian talk, what is happening now in Africa? What kind of brutal neo-colonial exploitation Africa is submitted to? Are we aware that all this Middle East crisis, Iraq, Syria, uh, was caused basically by Western uh, by crazy Western interventions there, and so on and so on. So, my God, let's start to deal with real problems. And let's, if you allow me slowly the conclusion, let's confront these problems in an open, direct way, not being afraid to hurt anyone. What do I mean by this? The big problem of today, of the left, especially when we witness the, let's call it, contact mixture of, dif mixture of different so-called ways of life is how to relate universal struggle for emancipation to the plurality of ways of life. Some people, I'm well aware, are even suspicious of the very notion of way of life, like if it doesn't relate to marginal minorities, isn't it almost a proto-fascist poison? Like, what right do we have to speak of our way of life and so on and so on? But I think we should precisely to openly confront problems. What problems? It's not what I'm sometimes accused of, that I privilege European way of life to be protected from barbarian others and so on and so on. I just claim this. Uh, there is uh, the preferred vision today is that of a united global world with all particular way of life thriving. Like, we, some of us are from Africa, some from here, Latin America, Asia, other. Why shouldn't each ethnic or religious cultural group be allowed its way of life? 
and not as something that threatens our identity, but something that contributes to a plural, rich world and so on. It is only when we in Europe, the majority, oppress the others, don't allow them to assert their identity, that they turn violent, that they withdraw into fundamentalism and so on. Hey, I find, and we are not uh, exempted from it, I find a problem with this vision. It's a false vision, this happy coexistence of the ways of life. Why? The first thing that psychoanalysis teaches us is that the core of a way of life, of what constitutes a specific way of life, is not simply cultural features, you know, religion, customs, and so on, but precisely, and we are back at Lacan, what Lacan called jouissance. Jouissance, excessive enjoyment, as a way to organize a social life. In Lacanian meaning of this term, le réel, the real, the core of a way of life is le réel, the real. And this way of life in its dimension of the real is materialized specifically at two levels, relations of authority and sexual relations. So it's easy, I notice this whenever I debated with leftists who accused me of racism, whatever, about what do we mean by different ways of life coexisting. They all enumerated features which are all the easy ones. They should be allowed their language, their poetry, their songs, their cuisine, whatever. Yeah, yeah, but what about what? What about this? Let me give you an example, and again, the same holds for us, but let me give you an extreme example. Some 15 years ago, and just for mentioning this example, I was almost physically attacked once in England. Some 15 years ago, a, a girl from Roma, Roma, the old-fashioned racist name, a gypsy, a Roma community in Slovenia, 12 years old girl, uh, uh, escaped from her family because her father planned to marry her to his best friend in advance, arranged marriage. And she took refuge to some Slovene, I don't know, healthcare center or, or police, doesn't matter. Uh, then the, an interesting thing happened. The, uh, representative of the Roma community said, wait a minute, do you respect our way of life or not? Sorry, arranged many marriages are a central feature of our way of life. If you take this away from us, we may remain as doing some stupid uh, folkloric songs and spicy cuisine, whatever, but as a community, we disappear. And it's the same with relations of uh, authority. Uh, for example, in India, caste system is still is, to a large degree, a central component of their way of life which is why even some of their post-colonial theorists don't want to renounce it. They just claim we have to accommodate it to today's life, but for example, when one mentioned, I mentioned there, what about egalitarianism? I was immediately attacked for brutally enforcing on India imperialist uh, Western notions or whatever. So my point is this one, that uh, this, complex of how you regulate pleasures in the same way as in bureaucracy. Uh, the pleasure of bureaucracy, as we all know, is not to solve problems. It's to use problems as a justification to reproduce itself indefinitely. It's the same with all these marriage regulations. The very marriage negotiation, subordination of women or whatever is what elevates a simple biological pleasure into social jouissance, enjoyment. And I claim when we talk about the way, the difficulty to integrate others into our way of life, it's not simply a question, do they want to be integrated? Are we really open to them? From their standpoint, I totally agree with them. It's false already to speak about integration, because to integrate means you become part of us. And they are quite right to say, why should we become part of you? But the problem is this one, that 
They feel very well, refugees, those who have problems with this, and they are right that we want to deprive them of their, the real of their ethnic way of life. And again, this is a problem. In what sense? Let me give you an extreme example, which is so extreme that I like it, but it's from Mexico this time. I read in the news uh, the theological implications of what I will tell you now are wonderful, although terrifying, that in some small Mexican city, three rich guys in their early 20s, students, brutally raped a young girl. One of them, the richest, of course, he had the best lawyer, was pardoned by the judge. Now comes the horror. He was pardoned not because his lawyer tried through some sophisticated tricks to dispute any facts. No, facts were without any doubt. He admitted he, in a vulgar, brutal way, squeezed the girl's breasts. He penetrated her with his fingers her vagina and so on, but it's madness. Check it up, you still find this story on the web, if you don't believe me, with names, everything. The defense claimed, and the judge confirmed it, that he did this without a carnal intent. He didn't sexually enjoy it, which is why he is not guilty. And he was pardoned. Now, if you excuse me, but for my common sense, Okay, it's very problematic what I will say, but I mean it in the best pro-feminist way. Let's say if I were to rape a woman in some kind of half-sexual craving madness, it's still unexcusable. But it's, I claim, maybe one millimeter better than to rape her without any passion. Because that would be pure evil then, you know? My God, why did I do it? if I even don't have the excuse of uh, passion and so on. It's pure evil. I wanted to hurt her, suffer, humiliate, and so on. So why then did the judge propose this strange solution? My idea is that the theological background, the judge's implication was that only if you enjoy it, you are guilty. That was simply the underlying premise, deeply theological Christian of the judge. If you enjoy it sexually, you are guilty. And the logical reversal, if you don't enjoy it, if you didn't enjoy it, you cannot be guilty. The interesting point here is that I think that we should bring this reasoning to the end. Not only if you enjoy it, you are guilty, but you only enjoy it if you are guilty. I claim that, and that's every, what every Protestant knows. You know what's the logic. You are here on the limit. In Catholicism, you can do whatever you want, just if you confess it at the end of the week, no? In Protestantism, as they say, you can also do whatever you want, just it's good that you feel guilty a little bit, what you are doing. It. You see, this guilt is again a surplus enjoyment. Enjoyment of sex without guilt is just a vulgar enjoyment. But feeling guilty gives this additional twist. It's something transgressive, heroic, whatever, and so on and so on. So what I'm saying is that it's at this level that integration, or however you call it, it's difficult. Why? Ah, now I come to a more, at least a little bit, philosophical concluding point. Because I think that this vision of each of us, its own, his, her, their uh, way of life, we all contribute to one humanity is wrong. What gets lost is universality. Universality is not something above our particular features, like we are all humanity, but to be cynical, uh, traditional Europe contributed to universality by patriarchal marriage, others contribute to universality by clitorodectomy or whatever or whatever. Universality, I think that's the lesson of modernity in a good sense. Universality is something that traversed, splits from within every particular identity. That's why I oppose this 
pseudo-universalist ideas that we have local communities, Western, Eastern, whatever, which are then disturbed by this bad horror of Western individualist universality, whatever. It is true, of course, I'm well aware of the destructive aspects of Western universality of human rights, which are not truly universal human rights and so on. But what I want to say is something else which is crucial. First, I dispute that something as authentic, local, pre-modern ways of life exists at all. I'm not saying they don't exist at all. I'm saying that by Marxist dogma, every particular way of life is already cut by its own antagonism. Stra class struggle, struggle for liberation, whatever you call it, emancipatory struggle, is at work in all of them. And my second point, the way to criticize Western cultural imperialism should not be only to see it as the bad universality destroying local ways of life, but on the contrary, sometimes even supporting them, manipulating with them. Let me give you a wonderful example that I experienced firsthand when I was in India. I learned there some strange things. Do you know that their caste system was already disintegrating in the century, I think it was 18th century, before British colonization of India? It was disintegrating. There, the main book, the mega Bible of caste system, the so-called laws legal system of Manu, some stupid divinity, whatever, uh, was half forgotten. Then, when the British took over India, they made a simple intelligent discovery that it's much better for them to efficiently colonize India, to maintain and even su sustain, support the traditional caste system. Because in this way, again, easier to keep them under control, the idea was that if we allow too fast modernization of India, they will get proletarians with their modern demands and so on and so on. So better to keep them in their traditional identity. And literally, in 19th century, they reprinted, propagated loss of Manu, and 19th century, the very time of British colonization of India, was the time of the revival of caste system. All intelligent colonizers were doing this. That is to say, not imposing simply Western universality, which is why India is a wonderful case. All colonizers, big British administrators, the more they were brutal in economic exploitation of India, the more they admired the incredible spiritual depth of Indian wisdom or whatever. I mean, it's wonderful to read the text of their colonizers. Like, I met a simple peasant. There was more wisdom in his simple prayer than all our corrupted Western uh, technology and so on and so on. And it's the same all around, I claim. It's the same, for example, on the West Bank, from what I know. Do you know that you do have on the West Bank, some honor killings. And what we don't read in our media is how there is, at least among Palestinians on the West Bank, a vast social movement, young people, Tamer Nafar, who has a great Palestinian rapper singer, a rock band, and so on, uh, protest against them. But strangely, Israeli occupying force don't, if possible, prosecute at all honor killings because they know it's much better for Israeli neo-colonialist aims of the West Bank to keep Palestinians in their traditional mode of life. Although they complain Palestinians are primitive and so on, their entire strategy is to do this. Or I can give you, I don't know how many other examples, to go back to my Slovene gypsy girl example. The father said, you are threatening our way of life. Okay, I ask you brutally, what would you have done? Whose side would you take? I'm not saying even you should be a Western liberal. I'm just saying admit the problem. And my formula is not we in the West have the solution. It's our universal rights and so on. I'm the first to admit that 
there is a cultural bias on our universal rights. You know the story. They privilege a certain type of social life with individualism and so on, against solidarity and so on and so on. I'm just saying the right path to do is not to oppose our universal values to uh, particular ways of life and then to choose either more authentic particular ways of life of our empty universality, but to connect our struggle here for women's rights, gay rights, economic struggle, whatever, with their struggles. That's the only option for me, to, to renounce this myth of automatic authenticity of local ways of life. Let me give you before I really conclude, and believe me or not, I will conclude at some point. <laughs> Let me give you a disgusting, terrifying example from Tibet. This example was given to me by a Tibetan himself, who is otherwise brutally critical of Chinese occupation, colonization, whatever, of Tibet. Do you know that till 49 or even 59, because till 59 Chinese authorities left in Tibet more or less to itself the traditional Tibetan way of life. They really intervened brutally only after 59, which is why then uh, uh, Dalai Lama escaped to India, you know the story. But the point is this one. Do you know that till 59, Tibet being a mountainous country, many narrow paths, there is, was there a certain rule. When they walk in the opposite way of a, on a narrow mountain path, two people who are not on the, of the same social status. Let's say a poor farmer and a, a, a Buddhist Lama monk, whatever. It was strictly ritualized. The poor guy, ordinary farmer, not only should step away, withdraw, to leave to the other the free path, but even perform a certain gesture. I, I was given a photo of it, which is really ritualized, disgusting self-humiliation. You should somehow lean down, look with your eyes up and stick your, like to enact your pure worthless stupidity. And then the Chinese prohibited it in 59. And of course, the local uh, uh, lamas and so on says brutal intrusion into our way of life and so on and so on. My point is, my rule would have been, the moment you have some local resistance to this, and it was, the tragedy of Tibet is that it wasn't a paradise before 49. It was the most brutal feudal system that you can imagine. You see, my point is not, we should destroy them. My point is, we have a struggle, they have a struggle, connect these struggles. It can be done. It's the only way, without our arrogance, uh, and so on, and so on. In other words, I believe in universality. I think the greatest catastrophe today is that even some leftists, those who were in United Kingdom pro-Brexit, and so on, believe that since European Union is just the voice of international, sorry, instrument of international global capital, the only way to protect workers' rights is a stronger nation state and so on and so on. I totally reject this strategy. I think that the only, first, capitalism no longer works like that, as I already mentioned with the example of uh, Erdogan, Russia, China. Today's capitalism is more and more from Trump to Erdogan to Putin to China to India, global neoliberal capitalism, but politically supplemented by a strong autarkic local tradition. Erdogan Muslim, Modi Hindu, Chinese there, Confucian stuff, and so on. So what I'm saying is that uh, uh, we should do what, for example, my authentic hero, uh, Malcolm X, and I, I did read his work, Malcolm X, for me, is not only Denzel Washington in the film. Uh, he's, for me, a model, a true genius politically. You know why? You know why did he keep this name, Malcolm X? X, of course, is the sign for lost roots. X means true 
enslavement, we lost our African roots. We don't have a proper family, it's X. But his genius was that he saw in this a unique chance of liberation. X means we are potentially more universal than Europeans. We have a unique chance of developing a new universality and paradoxically, one can understand why he found this universality in Islam. Okay, I don't agree him in this, but this basic gesture to see in what appears as the ultimate catastrophe, my God, we are deprived of our roots, a unique chance of new freedom. His solution is not the solution of those nostalgic Alex Haley roots and so on, stories where, oh, you look for your roots in Africa, you find a tribe where your ancestors were taken from, you found your roots. No, forget your roots. Open yourself even more brutally to universality. I think this is the only solution. It has to be a global solution of new reinvented universality. That's why I'm so suspicious of all those who praise so-called indigenism, you know, like global, bad global capitalism, but look for local traditions to resist it. Listen, these local traditions can usually be perfectly integrated into global capitalism. Global capitalism is by definition multicultural. It needs as many as possible different cultural identities to, to thrive. The only way to fight global capitalism is with new ideological, political, emancipatory uh, universality. What this practically means, well, maybe another talk. Thanks very much for your patience. Okay, now we decide that with the organizers, that before we go with the lady into a philosophical debate, although this is not true, but we will pretend that we are in a half democracy, so you will be allowed some questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> but yes. ah, okay, take this one. Okay. Hello? Okay, it works, yes. Will you? And you saw someone on the bin. There and there. Fons? Yes, uh, I would like to pick up your point about self revelation uh, and especially the persona struggle, the fatigue struggle. That yeah. Yeah. Uh, how, how, how they are used uh, as, as this self-revelation from the left perspective. Maybe sometimes a check on yourself and what you say. Uh, okay. Uh, you are aware more than me probably that to answer properly this question is not a matter of, of five minutes and so on. But I would have said that, no, my position is here, I'm well aware of it, very radical. I think, and I openly say it, although it sounds crazy, instead of what I call self-flagellation, we should proudly defend what is great in European legacy. No wonder that today it's so fashionable to be anti-Eurocentric. They're all united. Trump, Brexit, Putin, Erdogan, everybody. Why? Because precisely today, when Europe, when uh, Europe is losing its geopolitical significance and European legacy of enlightenment, universal rights, falsified as they were, is, uh, is under 
threat. So I'm tired of this as if our contribution to the world, no, let's focus on what, yes, we did in Europe horrible things, but one thing in European legacy I stand for is this immense dimension of radical self-criticism. I don't, here comes my arrogance, I don't find this in any other, I'm sorry for this arrogant word, civilization. This radical acceptance that our way of life is contingent and so on and so on. In other words, this is very problematic, I know, but I think that something that emerged with French Revolution, which is equality and so on and so on, is a unique event in world history with the world historical significance. My ultimate proof, if you want here, look at the first successful slave revolt in Haiti. I think this is a mega event. Why? Because they didn't want to return to their African roots. They wanted, like France, to have a secular republic. And it's a beautiful irony to it. You know, I'm sorry if some of you know it, I repeat this word. You know who, you know who was the main ideologist of Haiti revolution? Ideologist is a big word. One of the freed slaves who propagated freedom. It was a man called John Bookman. Of course, the guy who read a book. You know which was this book? Quran. So that you will not accuse me of... Uh, 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 Islamophobia or whatever. So what I am saying is that what I really hate is this humanitarianization of problem. Do we have a wide enough heart to accept them all and so on and so on? No, the main problem is how are we Europeans co-responsible for this refugee crisis? Because what is going there? There would have been no war in Syria without investments of foreign powers, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Russia, name them and so on. The same in Libya, the same in Iraq. So uh, I think that the only chance is to move out, which doesn't mean we don't help refugees, even more than we did. But if we will not do this move from humanitarian problem, where the problem is only they are coming, do we have open enough heart or not? No. Why are they coming? What can we do in economic change, in geopolitical change, and so on and so on? And we should, within this context, I always get in trouble when I ask this, also ask some unpleasant questions. For example, I was in debate about this with Al Jazeera, now I again gave it to them, and never did I get, not even, a semblance of a convincing answer. South of the crisis zone, you have a couple of very rich Arab countries. Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, Emirates. They simply don't accept immigrants. Where is their sense of UMA community and so on? I'm not blaming them because they are supported in this with the West and so on and so on. I know that there are many refugees, but where? In the poor Arab countries. So I think that, again, I just see red when the problem is posed in this way. Will we be open enough to integrate them? We should first change the topic to geopolitical, economic, neocolonialism, and point to openly establish rules with negotiation between the parties and so on and so on, out of this self-guilt, are we open enough to integrate them? Well, I understand them and I agree with them. They, maybe they don't want to be integrated. Uh, you know, the problem is like these stupid examples that I mentioned, uh, the, the Slovene Roma girl and so on. What, what does it mean, coexistence of different culture? Where do we set limits and so on and so on? Or do we set limits? How do we set limits? I'm not saying that we are right a priori. I'm just saying there is a problem in coexistence of lives. And we have the old solution, which was the British Empire solution or traditional. Give 
allow every ethnic religious group to remain in their way of life. I think this no longer works today. It's a problem. That's all I'm saying, that it is really a problem. And, but whenever I mention way of life, I'm usually attacked as a, a kind of, a, I was already called a Nitzlicher idiot, how the, the idiot arguing for Marine Le Pen. But uh, sorry, very briefly now, what you mentioned about this uh, self-flagellation and so on and so on. Well, all I can say is, I can tell you from my own experience that it's not as simple as that. Listen, let me be a little bit arrogant. You mentioned YouTube, blah, blah, but I'm not saying you should, but if you check a little bit my fate in the last years as so-called stupid public intellectual, just follow how I progressively disappear from the media. Up till two years ago, I was regularly invited to contribute to Guardian. In the last two years, I'm prohibited. I'm prohibited from laundry review books. I'm prohibited from new statement. I'm prohibited in United States two years ago, Economist from uh, uh, Newsweek from time to time published me. You know, all the time I heard how popular I am, the less now I simply don't have a medium to publish in United States and in England. The small exception is independent published my Macron comment, but again, they got a terrible backlash and now, because this usual way, you know, like if you are critical of Macron, it means you support Marine Le Pen and I'm a neo-fascist and so on and so on. So all I can tell you is that, uh, is that I'm a pessimist. Okay, I stop, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> But, but a romantic pessimist, we will see that. Yeah. Another question. Yeah. Say a little bit more loud or turn to the people. <laughs> okay. Uh, you are getting your phallic supplement to be <laughs> more efficiently louder. <laughs> Oh my God, you are phallogocentrists or whatever, not me, sorry. <laughs> yes, thank you. Okay. So, um, you already mentioned in your last sentence that this would not be in the scope of your, present, uh, your presentation, your, your talk, namely uh, how to actually uh, damage global capitalism or influence it in some way. Like, for example, now Trump just tonight arrived in Brussels for the NATO talks and there are huge protest marches, but of course, to some extent, we all know that this will not really impact anything. And, I'm wondering, for example, how the more traditional modes of, of, of resistance, like the labor unions and strike movements and such, for example, when Macron became president, there was an immediate, I, I forgot the location, but there was a factory um, that was immediately occupied and they were threatening with sabotaging and, and destroying mm -hmm. everything. For example, in, in, in this way, in some way, the, the global capitalist system is in some way impacted. And when you talk about the the sort of global eco-communism or eco-socialism mm. that is necessary to avoid catastrophic climate change and, and, and some mm. such things. Do you see a positive role for those more traditional but sort of neglected things like labor unions and strikes? Or is I, I do, but we have to rethink this all. I will try to be as short as possible. <laughs> uh, the problem with me is this one. You know, some of my friends have this idea, a very simplified one, Refugees are the new proletariat. They call it nomadic proletariat. And they can revitalize the European left. I found this an extremely racist position. I call it outsourcing revolutionary class. <laughs> like, you know, we have good revolutionary theory, but nobody wants to do it here. Perfect. We import the revolutionary class and so on. It will not work. You know, who is really my reference here? The German guy that I mentioned, he is now also popular in England, Wolfgang Streck, who says that, you know what's the problem? For Marx, the construction of a revolutionary class worked when you have majority working class which produces wealth, is exploited, and so on and so on. Today, isn't it that to be in the traditional Marxist sense, a proletarian, which means a permanent job in a factory or in a state organization. Yeah, okay, you are exploited, but you are permanently employed. It's almost a privileged position. We have 
most of the refugees, their secret longing is just to become probably a normal European proletariat, you know. They cannot. We have precarious workers. We have permanently unemployed. Other forms of excluded. And it's not clear to me, here I agree with the point of your question, it's a great problem, Marx so clearly this proletarization of society, how out of this confusion, uh, united emancipatory agent will emerge. I don't see in the near future how this could happen. So all I propose is a kind of a, not utopian, but very pragmatic approach. On the one hand, yes, I agree, all that we can do, workers' protections, trade unions, and so on and so on. On the other hand, uh, uh, on the, uh, for example, on the other hand, every, like, sorry, it's my eternal example, what Obama did in the United States, even with, for him, I have a certain sympathy. Okay, we have it, but they didn't have it. And now it's cancelled. Uh, how do you call it? Uh, uh, healthcare reform. This was a revolutionary idea for the United States and so on. So what we should do is choose well this particular point, which may appear relatively modest. Like, what is revolutionary about universal healthcare? But nonetheless, in the United States, this was almost a shock and so on and so on. In Europe, I would say, but obviously I'm too utopian, uh, some kind of, why can't European modest labor parties, trade unions get together? I know the attack will automatically be, this diminishes our competitivity, but I think it's bluff, it's not necessary. Some minimal workers' protection in Europe, and this is my argument against Brexit. It's very interesting, a British friend of mine provided me with a list of conflicts in the last 20 years between United Kingdom government and Brussels bureaucracy. Almost all the time I'm on the side of Brussels bureaucracy. For example, Brussels bureaucracy wanted to impose some ecological limits on, of energy use. Tony Blair opposed it, it diminished our competitivity. Then again, Brussels bureaucracy wanted to impose some minimal workers' rights, a minimum of holidays per year and a maximum of working hours per week. United Kingdom government opposed it, this uh, diminishes our competitivity and so on and so on. I think that we should shamelessly engage in all these particular struggles, but at the same time just getting ready. Getting ready in what sense? I am a pessimist, if you ask me. I think there will be ecological and other catastrophes. Don't be afraid that they will not come. <laughs> they will come. And for that point, we should be ready. But at the same time, I agree with you. Definitely, we should not just, as many pseudo-radical leftists claim, just sit back and wait for the big revolution to come. No, if you just wait, it will never come. But we should be getting ready. Because really, I'm too much of a pessimist in the sense that some of my friends, liberals, are telling me, but listen, nonetheless, with all our crisis, liberal capitalism, at least in Western Europe, it still works. Why don't we just resign to it? No? I claim, no. It, can, it may appear to work, but it's approaching its end. You can see it. Ecology, it's clear that we will need larger than state organizations and so on to cope with the problem. My God, uh, financing. It's clear where system is dying. Look, even me, who am in economy more or less an idiot, I got the basic point of how again and again, this is a tragedy of European Union, they are throwing it hundreds of billions of dollars into revitalizing economy. But what happens is that these hundreds of billions get lost and are enter privatized in this plain place with fictitious capital. And the more they are throwing these imaginary sums of money, of real money, economy remains stagnant. So we have a problem here. We have a problem with intellectual property. It simply resists 
private property. It will not be able to contain it. I'm saying this because after this talk, I know what I will download from Pirate Bay this evening. It will be the seventh installment of Handmaid's Tale, so that you know, if you want to clear it. Or refugees and so on. We need more organization there. I mean, uh, I sincerely believe that this idea that we live in relatively normal times, it's totally wrong. Things are changing. The main result of Trump's stupidity is already here. It is that it was a beautiful paradox. You remember two weeks ago, China imposed itself, offered itself as the new agent of globalization. They got it correctly that America is now too protectionist. So again, we are not even aware how fast things are changing. And up to a point, we can just passively follow it. In the long term, if we do nothing, where will we arrive? Hollywood knows it in its dystopia, something like Hunger Games and so on, a new class society. Perhaps one final question? But it should be a lady so that we can falsely claim that it was not only men. <laughs> it's, a, oh. it's a lady question? No, no it's, it's not, but <laughs> thank you, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> are you at least transgender? No. Yeah. No, you know you I'm very sorry. This is going to be a horrible <laughs> for diversity. Uh, big fan of both people on the stage. Um, my favorite work, uh, Zizekin work, is The Pervert's Guide to Cinema, which at this point is over 10 years old. You've mentioned The Handmaiden's Tale. You just mentioned... <laughs> Hollywood and its yeah. you know, futuristic, futuristic knowledge. Is there any uh, movie or film you've come across in the decade past which you think is worth mentioning or uh, perhaps demonstrates what we've discussed well, this evening? I will disappoint you here. My, what I, first, let me confess something. I'm very self-critical here. Whenever I deal with films, I try to be honest. I think that 80% at least of it is just exploiting simply narratives to make some ideological or even philosophical point. Very rarely do I really, by really I mean in a formal way, analyze a film. Because the true message of the film for me is always in a form. That's why and the only way where was I serious in my analysis? Hitchcock, Kislovsky, maybe a little bit David Lynch, Lost Highway, and maybe a little bit Tarkovsky. All other stuff is just using films. But if you ask me where am I now, I can just give you two indications. First, although this is a fashionable thing today, but I tend to agree with it that it's as if, to put in idealist Hegelian terms, the world spirit is moving from films to TV series. And I think quite interesting things, maybe more than in cinema, are happening there. I'm even ready to go so far as to say even in video games. Are you aware how important they are? Do you know that already some three years ago, I think, more money is turned around in video games than in entire cinema and TV industry? And it would be extremely interesting, I don't have time now, to analyze the, how should I call it, the uh, new type of subjectivity. I call it this obscene, pre edipal undead subjectivity that is the subjectivity of a gamer, of a game player. By this pre edipal perverted subjectivity, I mean the first model for me is here. You remember what's the magic of Tom and Jerry cartoons? Constant catastrophes, the mouse is cut and sliced into pieces, run over by a rollover. In the next scene, it, you, you cannot die. Always you return. And as Lacan pointed out in Count of Exad, exactly the same feature you find in, in Sadean fantasy. Juliette is tortured again and again, always survives. And it's something the same in video games. I know, I'm watching my son playing them, you know, like, you die again and again, you say, and now you will say this is fantasy. It's not as simple as that. Because I've seen some of my friends at assuming the same and that undead obscene attitude already also in their love life. I try with this girl, I die. It's a fiasco. No problem. I try again, you know, this false infinity. So here things happen. Point two, 
which films are today, my tastes are very strange. For example, lately I did like two very models, they are not even good, science fiction films, did you see them? The Arrival and The Discovery, which are very intelligent in their manipulation of this circular sense, sense of time and so on and so on. No, my tastes are much more, my tastes are much more uh, modest here. I'm just sad in the sense of this politically correct obsession of Hollywood, for example. I'm all for gay rights, black rights, but sorry to tell you something for which people started to shout at me when I was recently in New York. Moonlight, you saw it, the Oscar winner. It's good, I sympathize with it, don't tell me that it's a great film. And the problem is that almost in academic circles in the United States you are not allowed to say it. The moment you say it, ah, homophobic, racist, and so on and so on. So I had a luck that two black friends were with me who thought that this movie is a total shit, and then they immediately agreed with me. You know what I mean? Like, cinema, here I agree with you if you told me before that you are a formalist, you know. Like, look at Hitchcock. Maybe he's overestimated, but Hitchcock's art is not in the story. It's in how the camera moves in... Oh, the Hitchcock volume that I edited, I tried to develop an entire implicit theology from how the second murder in Psycho, the murder on the stairs of Detective Arbogast, is shot and so on. That's for me the magic of cinema. Cinematic art begins when you have a certain story and official ideology, but the texture of the film counteracts it, tells renders, literally renders, like embodies, not explicitly articulates another ideology. So I'm not a pessimist here. I also think a good thing about TV series is that they are a worldwide phenomenon. It's not just Hollywood. You have the Latin America telenovelas example. You have a Korea, Far East series, and so on and so on. In this sense, I even like... A, cultural globalization, it's not, it's on the contrary, a great blow to the simple hegemony of United States. Did you notice, for example, in detective novels that I like, the result of cultural globalization is now that it's no longer American, British, and maybe French detective novels. You have now Italians, Germans, Chinese, whatever. Not to mention, my God, you. No, you Belgians are not, you are not yet at the level of Sweden, Norway, and... Uh, and Denmark, you know, of de uh, detective novels. I think that there are definitely, that paradoxically, gl globalization means that also smaller nations get their chance. Sorry, I was just... Okay. Perhaps we can come to um, another kind of, perhaps, philosophical discussion, because that, that's the reason why I think they asked me to discuss with you. Because of the and fact now that you're trying to put the blame on others, you know. Like. <laughs> no, you wanted it, and I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> because I've been dealing with German idealism, it, with the father of it, Kant, most of the time, the students know that. And because I've been doing a little bit of psychoanalysis, I told you that. And I must say that um, what I did in psychoanalysis had an effect on what is for me philosophy. It, it had really a subversive effect. My own analysis, my practice as an analyst, and um, it, it fundamentally changed my position in relation to what it is to know, what, what is the drive to know. And I, I'm, I'm in a little bit of a turmoil today in the sense that it's a bit of an open question for me of what can be philosophy after the subversion of psychoanalysis. That's not immediately clear to me. So I want to address questions in this sense. Place of the philosopher after the subversion and place of the psychoanalyst in the kind of emancipatory uh, dynamics we know. But let me begin with, with the question of form because I found it nice what you said uh, tonight, namely that um, the dimension of critique. I think indeed that the, one of the important things you did is to show that there's a kind of thread from Kant, German idealism, 
to psychoanalysis. Few people see that, and it's a quite a logical threat. And it has, has to do, I think, with the dimension of criticism, um, with the dimension also of universality. Now, let's come to the question of universality and of form. Because what happened with um, modernity, modern sciences, is, let's say, a focus on form, a focus on legalization and on formalization, mathematization. And you know the work of Badiou, Lacan also, is stressing enormously the role of formalization. And he, for instance, Lacan takes up what Plato says in the Menon on, on uh, uh, where Plato promises to deal with the issue of value. And um, people are annoyed because actually he's dealing with what he calls the idea of the idea. And then he talks about numbers. Um, so in order to address the question of value, of what is an ethical position, let's say, we need formalization. And so th that's one thing I don't see you do immediately to focus like Badiou does on, uh, or like Lacan does on uh, formalization. So that's perhaps a small question uh, of why is that not, not your focus? And um, uh, in what sense it can be related to writing? Because if we, if we address the question of universality, the dream of modern sciences was to write the book of nature in mathematical terms, in universal terms. The formalist approach of the, the modern sciences was purely formalist. So do we need a new mathematical writing? That is actually what uh, Lacan is proposing. Um, perhaps other forms of writing. So that's the first issue of, uh, in relation to form. The second issue is more in relation to um, the, 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 the universal declaration of human rights. I found in, in one of, of your interviews, you, you came back to, his, uh, to it tonight, you said that you, you find that the, that principle has now um, potentially uh, a subversive role to play. And you, you repeated mm -hmm. it uh, this evening. Mm -hmm. um, it sounds as if now it has a special subversive role to play, and it's not immediately clear to me um, what the formal aspect of it is. It makes me think of what Kant says, well, that we are humans. What we are, that's not a question. So the distinction but between that sorry, and what? You can go on, but, but are you aware of this weird jump to aliens that Kant makes when he claims that his categorical imperative is not limited to humans, but to every intelligent life it will be f if it will be found on another planet? Yeah, yeah. That's wonderful that I find in yes, Kant, true. I mean. Yeah. Sorry, please go on. Sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> But, but my question was that, what, what can my you God. say any, yeah. yeah, my God, yes. Let's go back to the public because yeah. you ask such difficult questions. I yeah. mean, it's for another talk. Let me go like this. You know that I always find first Kant, sorry, not Lacan, not ambiguous here, but much more delicate on the one hand, and that's the greatness of Lacan. He totally rejects this traditional idea of putting the Freudian unconscious along the line of Schopenhauer, Lebenswelt, all those irrationalists, and so on and so on. It has nothing to do with this. As Lacan puts it emphatically, the Freudian subject, the subject of the unconscious, is the Cartesian cogito. It's a very clear statement. And uh, so uh, here I think Lacan is radically opposed to all those immersion in Lebenswelt, light world, you know, all those simple oppositions. A Kantian subject, uh, sorry, Cartesian subject is too abstract, rational. We should never forget that we are part of a certain living world and so on and so on. No, but for Lacan, Unconscious is on the side, if you want, of rational abstraction against life world. Unconscious is some drive which destabilizes 
our st the stability of our life world and so on. But you know how, if we were really to go into this topic, my starting point would have been this one. Lacan says, yes, the subject of the unconscious is Cartesian cogito, modern science. But you know, I'm sure better than me, that at the same time, Lacan says that the discourse of science is based on, on Verwerfung, foreclosure, which is not a good translation, but let's call it naively, exclusion of subject. And it, he means it this, I think, relatively simple way that scientific statements, they exclude truth as a factor. By truth, I mean the truth of your position of enunciation. Mm -hmm. Whatever your unconscious overdetermination, a scientific statement should be repeatable, valid for whoever announces it and so on and so on. While for Lacan, nonetheless, the dimension of psychoanalysis is in this sense the dimension of subjective truth, not the dimension of objective exactitude. I think here about, I'm sorry if some of you know this example, I know, sure that you know it, it's one of my favorite Lacan's small observations when he says, I don't know where, but I know he says it, he says somewhere a wonderful thing that I apply to politics that, oh, unfortunately, this has some kind of a male chauvinist twist, but that uh, if a uh, husband is pathologically, pathological, like excessively jealous of his wife, afraid that she is sleeping around with other men. And even if it's proven that all his suspicions are true, his jealousy is still pathological. You see, this is the dimension of truth beyond exactitude. Oh, the example that I always take here is that of, I'm sorry if some of you know it, I repeat myself, that of anti-Semitism. Let's say I debate with someone in Germany in 35 about Jews. I am trying to defend Jews. My anti-Semitic, not friend, of course, <laughs> blames them. If, we, if I accept the debate at the level of facts, I've already sold my soul to the devil, I claim. Because at the level of fact, the result will be that we both exaggerate a little bit, truth is somewhere in the middle. Look, my friend says Jews are exploiting Germans. Well, in some formal sense, this was true. There were also poor Jews, but there were rich Jews who were exploiting Germans. Then my friend says, Jews are seducing German girls. Well, all I can say is I hope they do and the other way around and so on. I'm sure it's at some level true. But you see my point. My point is that Hitler's anti-Semitism is wrong, it's ideology, not because it is not true. Of course it's not. To go to the end in my madness, it would have been a patholo uh, pathological formation even if, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> at the level of facts, it were to be true. Because what makes it pathological is not its truth or not, but the reason why does Hitler need a figure of the Jew to assert its identity. And this is not a question of knowledge in the sense of are Jews really like that. It's why does Hitler, for what pathological reason, does Hitler, or to put it in the terms of the title of my talk, what antagonisms does Hitler need to obliterate that are projected into the figure of the Jew? So all this for Lacan, although he oscillates a little bit, for Lacan is, I don't see how this dimension of reference to put it in Lacanian terms to subject of enunciation, my truth position, this is a dimension which doesn't fit science. When Lacan says that the subject of psychoanalysis is a subject of science, he, I think, simply means, as you said correctly, this 
subject which is desubstantialized. You know what's so deep about Freud? It's one story, I think I mentioned it in one of my old books, I'm sure you don't know it, which is a beautiful story. The best anecdote that happened to Freud. In Slovenia, I don't want to sound, sound as tourist guide, but we have one caves in the south, not Postojna caves, there with the train, subterranean kids. But another, so-called Scotsian caves, which are wild, deep, they are terrifying. And you know that we discovered now that, literally, it's not a joke, Dante visited those caves in South Slovenia, and there he got the idea of hell, okay. of inferno. Okay, but what I want to say is that <laughs> something incredible happened there. In the darkest part of a cave, he saw a dark figure, a man approaching him. And for a moment he thought it's a vision, madness. Then he recognized the man. You know who was? Karl Lueger, the anti-Semitic populist mayor of Vienna. And Freud was totally shocked, and I can see why. He got there staged the deepest lesson of his teaching, which is that if you look really deep into a person, you don't find in the Jungian or New Age style some deeper, deep truth. You find Lüge, Lüge, lie. You find a fundamental fantasy which is a lie. It's a contingent lie, masking, antagonism, and so on and so forth. But if I may return it, I would like to make one point why I like Kant so much. Would you agree, I've written about it, that uh, first, in what does really Kantian revolution, ethical revolution consist? It's not simply in, just in formalism. It's in something much more radical. When Kant says, du kannst, then du sollst. You can because you must. It, I think Kant is really very radical here. He knew that, as Lacan would have put it, there is no big other. In what sense? Kant is usually read as a fetishist of duty. You must do your duty, whatever. No, no, no. Kant is even worse, but in a good sense. Kant's point is not, let's say I have to do something which will hurt you, but I think it's my duty. And then, hypocritically, I tell you, sorry, but I have to do it, it's my duty. You cannot even use duty as an excuse for duty. You are not only obliged to do your duty, responsible for it, but you should also fully stand behind what is your duty. You cannot say, this is my duty, I cannot sure. help it. You are responsible for your yeah. duty. That's Kant's modernity, because in previous substantialist ethics, duty is up there, uh, 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 imposed by God, whatever, and your duty is to do your duty. And that's the same in uh, psychoanalysis. Sorry, in? Yes, ne, ne precisely. Pas son désir, this is ça. wonderful. Okay. You are now saying what I wanted to say. Okay, Perfect. good. No, no, what I want to say is that, <laughs> that they get it, that, you know, uh, uh, Freud, although, you know, all that bullshit, but it can also be mis... Lacan can be misread in the sense that when he says unconscious is the discourse of the other, as if he think, oh, fuck it, what can I do? The other speaks through me. No, you are decentered, but you are still radically responsible for it. You cannot ever in psychoanalysis evoke your unconscious as decalpibilizing no, you. No. Sorry, I couldn't help it. My and the other is personified much too quickly. The other is also the body in, in Lacan. Sorry, the other? It's also the body. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but so again, we think of it as the this other. was never clear to yeah. me. Which body, you know, because can't, we have biological body, we have phantasmatic body, and so on, you know. Yeah, the thing Here, that, that is something that you have to appropriate. But that may is I out just there. answer very briefly the last of your question? Yeah. I agree with you. Concerning human rights, you know, there is a certain all too easy Marxist, pseudo Marxist, I claim, historicist critique, which says, oh, human rights are just uh, ideological universality. And that's what Badiou says. What? In, uh, that's Badiou's viewpoint? 
Alain Badius? I have and minor it, misunderstandings yeah. okay. with him here. And the, you know, then the usual Marxist historicist bullshit, they always mask particular interests and so on and so on. No, the first thing, and that's where you quoted me correctly, uh, precisely because they are formal human rights, even if it's true in the beginning, they were class biased, by, but from the very beginning, with their very abstract form, they opened up the space. Look, you know the story. It was immediately a Mary Wollstonecraft. We also, women, should be included. It was blacks in Haiti. We should be included. So paradoxically, as a good Hegelian, I would say this, there is more truth in the form of human rights than in their content. Okay, thank you. Good. <laughs> You are my Rosa Luxembourg, <laughs> I agree with you. Okay. Um, another question. Please. Um, I'm quite into uh, Logique du Fantasme these days. Lacan's 14th... I am with you. I would like to... Yeah, it's, it's, the greatest, it's... One of two, three formative. greatest Lacan. Yes, yes. If you want to know something about the sexual act, you should read it. It really is, and about the difference, male, female, because lots of things are being said these days about it. We will perhaps come back to it. But... At one point, Lacan says, uh, talks about Dio Diogenes, it's a difficult name to pronounce, um, and I don't, I would rather not enter to, into, into the debate on, on cynical reason, that's not my point, but what he's saying is that, um, you know, Diogenes, the philosopher with the barrel who masturbates in public, and, and asks Alexander the Great yeah. to move away because he is sun, shadow, yeah. Yeah. shadow that he doesn't see the sun. Yeah. yeah. So Lacan says um, he, Diogenes is an example of the fact that sexual pleasure is se the sexual act is purely related to pleasure, and Lacan is arguing that um, that's not what the sexual act is about. The, the satisfaction it brings is not pleasure, it, or it's, that's not the purpose of it for human beings, for speaking beings. Yeah. So he says, there's a price to pay for Diogenes, he says. Um, the price to pay is that he's not in desire, Diogenes, and he's not in politics. So I he's found not, sorry. in politics. Yeah, yeah. So that connection between desire and politics is interesting, brings me to a phrase of uh, a friend, uh, a psychoanalyst who, who, who died a couple of years ago, but who always said to me, um, la pointe fine du discours est politique. So when you sharpen your discourse, and that is what you do in, in uh, psychoanalysis, um, it becomes political immediately. So, um, frankly, when you um, ended your uh, lecture, it's, yeah, the catastrophe is near, we have to do something. It sounds a little bit like that. I almost immediately have the reflex of, as a psychoanalyst, one by one. And there's lots of work to be done. I mean, you have to produce the lack. And the, the, the lack is not something you observe, you don't observe yeah, it, yeah, you yeah. produce it. And the, it's the dynamics of producing it that brings you somewhere as to your position in the world, which has to be a desiring position and is immediately a political position. In, in that seminar, Lacan also says that um, l'inconscience est politique. C'est politique. Yeah. He doesn't say la politique c'est inconscient. L'inconscience est politique. And I think he means the same thing. That when you let it speak, it's immediately in it. The other is included, of course, in the, in, in the structure of language that is the unconscious. So. Oh, this is again another complex question. <coughs> I would put it like this. Uh, first, yes, you are absolutely right. Uh, L'inconscient et politique, it's not the same as politics is unconscious. Politics unconscious, it's pure Jungian bullshit, no? It means political games are really grounded in some deep unconscious archetypes and so on and so on. While, as you indicated, unconscious is political, means that unconscious is not some kind of uh, uh, archetype truth in me, but is something precisely, it's almost, I'm tempted to say, to quote here, X-Files, you know, at the beginning, the truth is out there. It's out there in social interaction, it's embodied there. And that's, in what sense, then, it is political? 
The only way I can read it is, although I had great problems with him, in the sense of uh, Laclau, discursive struggle, and so on, that uh, political means for me at its most fundamental dimension, not in the sense that usually we speak of psychoanalytic politics in the sense of for which party are we. Although we find here some sad examples, like Jacqueline Miller in one before last election being against pro Sarkozy and so on, strange things are going on. But what I'm pol political in the sense that it's an act of, as you would have put it, producing new master signifiers, negotiable strategic decision. It's not objective knowledge that you just discover there. It's and so, uh, 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 this would be my first point about uh, unconscious is political. And in this sense, I'm even tempted, I develop this in many of my books, to read, and I like it more and more, the most traditional part of Marxism, Marx's uh, logic of commodity fetishism. What Marx is saying there, he is not saying the usual stupidity. We are, insofar as we participate in the market, we are caught in a commodity fetishism. We don't see that commodities are just networks of social relations. No, Marx says something wonderful. Marx says fetishism or ideology generally for Marx is not things are really like that, but they appear to you in a distorted way. No, Marx is saying something much more refined, that one thing is how you experience things at the level of your consciousness. Another thing is how things really are, but there is a third thing. All the illusions that, even if you don't believe in them, you practice them, they are embodied in your practice. For Marx, commodity fetishism is not some, like Marx himself gives this example, a typical bourgeois subject is not some mystic, theological mystic. You, you, you're usually utilitarian pragmatic. What is money? Piece of paper gives me blah, blah, blah. But so where is commodity fetishism? It's not deep in you. It's an illusion embedded in how you interact on the market. It's out there. It's a wonderful theory of something can be an illusion which structures your practice, even if you don't believe in this illusion. There are, as my good friend, the Austrian philosopher Robert Fahler developed in his wonderful notion of interpassivity. There, there are beliefs into which nobody believes and they still function as beliefs. Mm -hmm. And this is crucial for me of how ideology today functions. Do you allow me to say a joke which, it's not a joke, it's an anecdote of Niels Bohr. You heard it probably here, I used it 50 times. Okay, it's a perfect example. I will use it 51st time. About Niels Bohr, you know the story. He had a house in the Danish countryside and above the house, farmer's house for weekend trips, was a horseshoe, superstitious item preventing evil spirits to enter. And then a friend visited him there and said, but why do you have that horseshoe above the entrance? Are you crazy? Do you believe in it? And Niels Bohr answered, I'm not crazy. Of course, I'm a scientist. I don't believe in it. Then a friend asked him, but why do you have it there? This superstitious item preventing allegedly evil spirits. And Bohr gave, Niels Bohr gave a perfect answer. He said, I don't believe it, but I have it there because I was told that it works even if you don't believe in it. That's our ideology today. You don't have to believe in it, but you, in your materiality, you practice a belief. This, here I see a perfect link between Marx, but just to conclude, sorry, Beverly, that uh, human rights point, no? It's also, you know, Marx is not just a historicist who says everything is historical relative. His greatest point about capitalism is that it's more universal than we think. World market is for Marx, Marx a practice of universality. Marx is not this primitive historicist who says, you know. So I will not go into it, we develop this, uh, and also my good friend, the other Slovene-Lacanian, Alenka Zupancic, 
he is the greatest of our Stalinist Slovene Troika, me, Mladen, Dolar, and Talenka, to punch it. She published in French, in English, in German, a book, Illusion of the Real, Kant uh, avec uh, Lacan, uh, where, yes, she goes in detail into this, in what sense, as Lacan puts it very clearly, that if you, to this you were, I think, alluding, that if you look at the starting point in European history of ideas, out of which Freudian psychoanalysis grew, it was not some kind of Nick Hartmann or whoever, Leben's philosophy, it was Kant's critique of practical reason. And she develops this in a wonderful yeah. way. Sorry, I talked too much. I think, I think we're near the end. I wanted to ask... The you last blow. You yeah, know what no, I deserve no. now? You know, no, I, I'm going to ask you a question about love. I told you. Love, oh my God. Uh, yo, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I just want to make two small remarks. Please? First, um, I wanted to ask you a question about euthanasia. I will not do that because... I agree well, with you. We talked in the car. Yes. I am against euthanasia in the cases where causality... The reason for despair is clearly, purely psychic. Or yeah, but the, the, the words you used in relation to Sloterdijk, uh, in my opinion, are applicable. Um, what is at work here now in Belgium, in the case of mental suffering alone, is cynical resignation and an ideology of good death. And that's really that very, I agree. very totally problematic. Opposed. I agree. That. And then yeah, yeah. the second thing we will not discuss it is the gender issue. The that I had the gender. gender yeah, yeah. Um, you mean all this uh, 32 yeah, all this, sexes, yes, yes. LGBT I, and I, so on. <laughs> Did you notice the nice ideology of plus? The list is never complete. So now yes. the finally <laughs> established formula is LGBTQ plus. Yes. And for me, plus is Lacanian object A. You know that. <laughs> you don't know what it is, but you have to add it to be complete. Sorry, well, I interrupted well, you. The, the, I, I, we are not going, it's not a question, but I had a slogan actually that was brought to me by yeah. my colleague from uh, Brussels, Ariane Bazon, who, said, who says in relation to the 32, 35 distinctions, he, she says 35 distinctions, but no difference. Yeah. Exactly, yes. It's a clear case of, to put it in Lacan's term, of the disavowal of il n'y a pas de rapport sexuel, yeah, exactly. of sexual difference as impossible. Yes. Yeah. Because you know what's the, I mean, to be clear, at practical level, I know, I met some of them, and they're much more intelligent than these fashionable characters fighting for tertiary sexes, really suffering transgender people. You know why they are authentic? Because they know that, their tragic position of not finding sexual identity is just an extreme effect of a lack of identity which pertains to sexuality as such, according to Lacan. This is what Lacan means by il n'y a pas de rapport sexuel. And that's one of my problems with this categorization that you have now 32 identities, men, human, butch, bigender, trigender, transgender, whatever, and it is as if, if we add enough categories, then, oh, I'm that, I will be happy to find my identity. That doesn't work. And goes with it, the idea that by naming it, and it, it installs a kind of political correctness that is terrorist, I think. <laughs> no, no, I tend to agree because yeah. that's why I don't think as some benevolent critics of political correctness claim that political correctness goes too far, it's too... No, it doesn't go too far, it's simply wrong. <laughs> I'm crazy to the end here. No, no, not wrong in the sense that, I'm more radical here in the sense that there is no sexism, there is no... Rep all that exists, and we should fight it without mercy, and so on. But there is something fundamentally false in the politically correct way of fighting, this way, as if through regulation of speech, what political correctness wants to achieve through regulation of speech is for me deeply not only counterproductive, but it's really, uh, how should I put it, uh, isn't, and here it brings us back even to Diogenes and so on. Wouldn't you agree that political correctness is basically a fear of the neighbor as such, 
neighbor as the real yeah. neighbor sex being and so on. Yeah. Because that's why I always found suspicious the term harassment. Harassment basically means don't come too near to me, you annoy me. You know, it's this basic, I was accused of this, you know, like uh, in America, United States, it can be madness, you know. You look, a woman, look, if I were to do this at some campus, you would be able to accuse me of visual rape. So I was accused of all possible rapes already, not of a real rape, but of <laughs> visual rape, verbal rape, I don't know what. But I got it. That's why also there is another enigma that interests me so much. Uh, uh, fear of smoking. I don't smoke. Probably it's true, all that they say. But this obsession, which is very selective, just with smoking. I cannot resist laughing at this paradox, how the same of my American leftist friends, who oppose smoking fanatically. I was at a party once where oh, oh, smoking, they should be prohibited. And then they distributed opium or crack at the end of the party. Like, that's not a problem, you know. And especially this passive, it's really this annoyance of, you know that it's dangerous, how could you enjoy it so openly and so on. It's an extreme desire of regulation behind it. And the fear of the other as subject of desire. And that's the problem of political correctness. Some intelligent feminists in the United States made a wonderful observation. They claim that, are we aware that in the standard process of erotic gain seduction and so on. It doesn't go that the whole, sorry for this name, charm of seduction is that one, sometimes men, sometimes a woman, and that's good, at least here we have equality of sexes. You have this intense erotic gain, and then somebody, as they say, has to make a gesture, open. And then at that point, you risk. Either the other will accept it, or it will proclaim that it was harassment or whatever. And this intelligent feminist said something wonderful. It's a deep, she said that, can we imagine purely political sex without this element of harassment? Yes, pure prostitution contract and so on. Mm. That's the sad thing that some feminists know, that the only way that you do it in this totally correct way is through, although even this can be eroticized, the best advice that I heard from a doctor, it's so deeply true, I claim, against impotence, and I wasn't the one who had this problem, <laughs> so, uh, was this one. Don't follow this oriental, pseudo-oriental bullshit. Don't think, just do it spontaneously. No, turn it into bureaucratic procedure. You have a lover, you cannot do it. See, sit down and make a bureaucratic plan. After three minutes and a half, you stick my, I will stick my finger there. Then you will kiss me there. And then there is a debate. She said, no, I want to stick my finger there already at two minutes and a half. Then you have a debate, and then one solution is that after a debate, why don't we simply go to bed or whatever, and it works, I can promise you. It works, this, you know, like, uh, so that's almost, I would say, the only thing that I like about political correctness that in a weird way, it can be re-eroticized, ironically. Okay. And it works in a wonderful way. Everything can be re-eroticized. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you will not escape that question of love, of course. We will end with that. Is it, I, I, I think you are a romanticist. Absolutely. Are Car you a- Card-carrying romanticist. <laughs> a day. formal? Formalist romanticist? Absolutely. Okay. In theory, in a, a rebellious romanticist? Sorry? Rebellious? Mm. What is... Yes, in principle. No, and not now. No. <laughs> I'm not un giving you a, a Radio Erevan answer. I'm just saying that the world rebellion and resistance, you should know this, is so misused today, you know. It's part of the ruling game. That's why I hate, for example, although I was there, but su su supporting my friend, Venice Biennale, did be this big Biennale, visual arts. They are fully part of capitalist machinery. 
but it's part of the game that you proclaim that you fight capitalism and self-critically you proclaim that you know we are totally manipulated by capital and so on and so on. So just, I'm very suspicious of this, you know, using too much, but rebellion in this basic sense, yes, absolutely. Romantic, yes, absolutely, because the opposite of romantic is for me cynical, not cynical in a romantic way, but every power is cynical. For example, I don't believe, here I was opposed already when I was young to uh, Umberto Eco's The Name of the Rose. This stupid idea that laughter as such has a liberating effect. It can have, but my God, didn't he ever see this cynical laughter of those in power, how they mock you? Mm. I mean, my formative experience in very modest dissident activity was once I witnessed, uh, 40 years ago, 30, a uh, small dissident meeting, some victim protesting in a very pathetic way, and what we later discovered, secret agent of, agent of the secret police of the party, did something ingenious. She, he didn't confront her as a harsh politician. How dare you say this reason? He imitated her, this poor woman who was protesting, mocked her, making fun, and ruined her performance. My deep experience is how intelligent power uses mockery, irony, laughter, it's much more efficient. Even now, maybe you did it two days ago, I read on uh, Google News or whatever, I don't know, that new American alt-right now is discovering irony and jokes to promote their agenda. So I don't buy this too much of, oh, a little bit laughter liberates and so on. No, no, no. I mean, this sounds romantic. Sometimes you have to risk this good, pathetic, romantic, passionate attachment, and it's the irony which is on the side of power. Yeah, and transgressive. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you Where very much. Where is love? <laughs> you didn't okay, ask okay. me about love. No, because I, <laughs> what I wanted to say <laughs> is that, now I will shock you, the last statement. You know, it's now fashionable to say polyamory, you know. You, uh, a guy can love more than one human being, whatever. I doubt it. You know why? Because love in this case is this pragmatic, utilitarian love. I love you for this reason, I need another man for another reason, another woman for that reason. But for me, real passionate love, and it still exists, it's much more un conditional. It's not that I love you for some reasons. It's simply I love you because, sorry for this pathetics, I cannot imagine living without you. It's this radical impossibility. And here you cannot play. I cannot live without you because of your legs. I cannot live without you because of your eyes and so on. It must be this uh, unconditional aspect. Isn't it clear that the moment you can nominate reasons for love, it's no longer love, it's uh, mental housekeeping, you know. This type of love mm -hmm. is, you have, sorry, imaginary women. You have nice eyes and legs, you have nice breasts and hands, and then I made a list, oh, her list is better, I will love you. Mm -hmm. No, this is why I claim for structural reasons, and Lacan knew it, he mentions this, true love, is the highest act of freedom, which precisely for this cannot be ever experienced as a free act in the sense of free choice. It's not, oh my God, I will now freely fall in love for you, no. True love is precisely, all of a sudden you discover you already are desperately in love. Mm -hmm. It's never the present moment, now I will fall in love or whatsoever. You see, this German idealist knew this. Kant, in his, uh, my favorite Kant is the late one, religion, religion within the, uh, he describes there this structure, he has a wonderful speculative formulation of how this eternal transcendental free acts with you, which you always experience as uh, necessary, you know. True freedom is not, I go to a patisserie and choose chocolate or strawberry cake. True freedom is, let me give you a pathetic example. 
sorry for the pathetic, my country is occupied, I decide to fight the aggressor. You don't decide as a free choice. You decide to risk your life, your life because you feel that simply you cannot do otherwise. That you couldn't look yourself into the mirror, you will be too, you know. This is my uh, much more refined point of which Kant was aware. True freedom is to assume what you experience as your fate in the sense of you cannot do it otherwise, but you are still responsible, it's still your mm -hmm. free act. And just one sentence to end because it's late and if you still want to sign your books, love is unconditional but not unlimited. Absolutely and correct, yes. And that's the exercise, I think, of a psychoanalysis. Yes. It is ne pas céder sur son désir and castration. Oh, absolutely. And the paradox, <laughs> nice paradox of Lacan is that uh, this is not kind of a not even, it appears as a paradox, but in reality, no. no. Castration is a condition of being unconditioned in this sense, no? Okay. No, 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 Lacan has here, and I hope we agree, I'm sorry we don't have right room now, that precisely, people usually say, yes, Freud had its actuality 100 of years ago with Victorian England, but not today. No, today is the true time of Freud. Because Freud's paradox from the beginning was not, you want to do some sex acts, but because of eternalized paternal authority, you cannot, no. Freud's paradox was from the beginning the paradox of superego, like precisely when you allow desire without constraints, itself sabotages itself. And this is what is happening today. Our superego today is not obey authorities, enjoy and so on. Mm. And we have more frigidi frigidity and impotence as ever. And the Kantian way of saying it is the constraint is the possibility. Yeah. That's the light dove of Kant. That's why I also am on poly, uh, for, uh, uh, against polyamory. The ideologies of, uh, of polyamory try to present their choice as more wealth in your life. Like, why just one person? It can be more, it liberates you. No, as you said very nicely, mm. the constraint is what gives strength to your Is the possibility. Yes. It's within the constraint mm -hmm, is mm -hmm. all the... Thank Mr. Zizek, very much. Thank you I'm very so much. sad that we um, cannot go on to this, like in Chinese cultural revolution. They have these tortures, <laughs> they shouted at you for two days. I would like to have a debate like you okay. in this sense. Thank, thank you, you very thank much. You very much. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, to conclude this evening, I have to say a few thanks from Salva Khan. First of all, we really want to thank Slavoj Zizek for his interesting and animated talk here at Vuret. Thank you very much. We also have to thank um, Dr. Jan de Vos um, voor de inleiding op deze avond. Dank u wel daarvoor. En ook voor het mogelijk maken eigenlijk van deze avond dat deze grote meneer naar, de, naar Gent mocht komen. Um, we bedanken ook Gertrudis van de Vijver. Now you speak a language that I don't understand, no? And I hope you said something. Thank you for tolerating this boring idiot, me or whatever. Because you know that I cannot understand you, no? Well, yeah. Sorry.